Uh, let's see if we've got audio now. I'm not sure. It says it's broadcasting on that end. Uh, you shouldn't be seeing adverts. Let's see. Did I get audio now? Uh, let's see if that did anything. Okay, Steve Martin says yes. I.L. Peleg says no. Mark Kulig says yes. Okay, now. All right. Perfect. All right. Sorry about that, guys. As I was saying, when we first started out, this is a little bit of inside baseball. I now know that um, I'm going to have to edit this which means uh, seven minutes in. Okay. Uh, I apologize for that. Um, I'm going to have to put a note to in the description to um, scrub forward to seven minutes in before my audio comes on. It's not YouTube. What this is, and this is what I was talking about when you couldn't hear me. A little bit of inside baseball. I was going to ask how my video feed looked because I got a brand new camera and it's all hooked up and running. The problem was when I plugged in the new camera, it automatically by default went to the uh, microphone built into the camera. This is my first live stream since adding this new camera. And I thought I had the audio set right. Turns out I didn't have it, so I had to add another audio device. I got to go back in and clean this up. I could broadcast through four different pieces of software I have now. And um, it's just trying to get the ding-dong thing set up right. I should have done a test, and I didn't do a test. That's my fault. I apologize for that. Um, this camera, the other camera only broadcast in 720p. Uh, this one is 1080p, uh, 60 frame a second, and it should be a little bit clearer. Not that you wanted to see me in any more detail, but, uh, so this is the first broadcast with the new, uh, the new camera. Thank you. I look great and everything and all that other good stuff. I'm going to have to scroll way back up for questions. But before I do, I need to make a few corrections that um, I need to make a few corrections to the videos. Uh, Mike Mazalik helped me out big time this morning when I was talking about uh, let me switch over here to Aspire, and I'll go, I think I'm going, uh, yes, I'm going. Uh, okay, we'll go into 2D view. I'll switch over to the top and get off of this layer, go into this layer here, shut that one off, and maximize. I think I'm, yes, I am. Okay. Okay. When I was talking about the carving the 3D model in my 3D roughing toolpath and making it a huge point to not, I didn't want the bit to go beyond this vector. That's why I'm machining to the selected vector here. I didn't want the bit to go across the rim of my material. He pointed out to me something that I completely, totally forgot about. And that was the bit is going to go past this uh, vector anyway. It's going to go approximately half of the diameter of the bit. But with the, with the taper, the slope built into this, it's going to continue up. It does do it in the video. If you look at it very carefully and very closely... The bit does come up past this vector in the video. But when we go into the 3D view and look at it, it doesn't leave any marks here 
on the top rim. And that was what I was concerned about. But as he pointed out to me, if I were to change my uh, orientation a little bit and drop this rim down in the model, it would come over about halfway, about, about half of the bit's diameter in carving this surface. So in doing the 3D roughing tool path here, if I wanted to make sure that it didn't go beyond this, I would need to enter a negative offset here, which I don't think it'll do. But anyhow, so it the bit will kind of go over the edge of the rim, but it's not leaving any marks, thankfully, which is what I was hoping. So we'll get rid of, uh, we'll go back over to me and not this thing, and I'll uh, look at your comments over here. Um, let's see, the, um, Kurt Briegel says the video looks great. Which camera did I get? I got a Logitech. I was looking for the 920, but they no longer make the 920. And I've heard mixed reviews about the 922, that it isn't worth the extra money. So I went ahead with the, uh, what's it called? The um, ProStream webcam. It was $65 versus the over $100 for the uh, C922. And I didn't really need, um, I didn't really need all of the little bells and whistles that uh, the 922 offered. I just wanted better resolution on the camera. So... Uh, that was what I went with. Excuse me. <coughs> Boy, these allergies just will not go away. Well, I didn't get to go down the list and say hello to everybody here before we got going because I figured it was, we were already um, too far in with me trying to figure out the audio. So um, let me go ahead and get into the questions and everything that we had today. Um, let's see, Malcolm Temporal says, I'm in Cyprus, I'm interested in inlays, and I knew you are go -to, to do a, going to do a video. Yes, I will later on down the road. I'm going to be doing some inlays for Christmas gifts this year. A friend has put some files up in 10.2, and I have 9.5. Is there anything I can do? No, you can't. The files are not backwards compatible. The software is backwards compatible, meaning if you have 9.5, if somebody sent you a file from 9.0, you could work with those files, but you can't work with anything created on a newer version. You would need to upgrade. And let me tell you, the difference between 9.5 and 10.5 is a dramatic difference and well worth every penny. So... I would definitely go ahead and upgrade. Then you could use those files. <laughs> so, uh, let's see. I.L. Peleg um, has a question about today's videos. Uh, are there any alternatives for manual cutting and sanding the tabs? For example, could you, after cutting the flip side, add some clamping on top, then cut away the tabs? You could. Um... And I'm also looking into different options as far as uh, maybe hot gluing the piece down after that's been cut out and then coming back and using rest machining to get rid of those tabs. Uh, but as it sits right now, I the tabs are, are very short. They're only about an eighth of an inch thick. So let me see what is an eighth of an inch in uh, bear with me, please. Uh, that's only about three millimeters thick. So it, it's not a lot of sanding, but yes, I can understand where sanding would be a pain to do. Um, you could clamp them down in other areas and then do some rest machining to get rid of those tabs as well. But um, you'd have to be careful of where you place those clamps 
and make sure that the bit when it after it machines a tab when it lifts up and rapids over to the next tab it doesn't hit a clamp which is very common so you'd have to be real careful in your setup uh, that's why i was looking into possibly hot gluing it hot gluing the bowl down then cut those tabs manually with my little oscillating tool lift that piece out leaving the bowl behind and then rest machining those tabs away i just haven't physically done it which is why i didn't suggest it in the video so uh robert dymock says uh snowing here need any bite your tongue i don't do the four letter s word so uh let's see uh yes i all you're asking is there a way to 3d carve just a small area of the model yes it's called rest machining i did a video on that and i'll put a link in the description where's my pen here's my pen uh rest machining is the way to go i just made a note to put a link in the description of this video as soon as we're done i'll put it uh i'll put that link to that video there uh, let's see, um, Norman Peterson says, the dish is my next project in Myrtle Wood. That would look cool. I've not had a chance to carve Myrtle Wood yet, but I want to. You'd think Southern Oregon, Myrtle Wood country, I'd have done it. I just haven't. Let's see. Um, now we're scrolling past all my notifications that there is no sound. <laughs> uh let's see no um norm your hearing aids are working just fine uh let's see let me go down here and uh, get back in here all right uh rob lemke wants to know have i ever built a cribbage board and if so what's the process for drilling the holes i did a video I'm trying to remember which one it was. I will look for it. I did a video in which I used a cribbage board as an example. And I showed how to use the drilling tool path to drill all of those holes. I will find that video and link it in the description. I don't remember which one it was. Uh, but I just wrote a note to myself to put a link to that in the description of this video. As soon as we get finished here... I will go ahead and post that just as quick as I can. Um, the uh, Basically, you will need a bit that is the correct size. So most cribbage boards, the holes are eighth inch diameter. So just an eighth inch up cut bit. Do not drill with the down cut bit. Do not do it. Um, you'll need an eighth inch up cut bit and it'll just peck down and drill the holes that you need. Something else, if you look in your clip art library in V-Carve or Aspire and look for 2D, I believe it's called 2D Games. Um, let's see what it's called. Yes, it's called 2D Games Layouts. They have some layouts for cribbage boards there that you can customize. And they have rounds and ovals and rectangulars. It's very cool. And they've done all the hard work for you of laying out all of those holes. <laughs> so, let's see. Mark Kulig says, question, when you drilled the alignment holes on video today, why did you drill only halfway or less on one end at a time to mount the board to align it when I flip it over. I do that so I don't want to drill all the way through because regardless of what you guys think of me, I need things as idiot proof as possible. And if there is a way for me to mount the material the wrong way, I'll do it. So if I drill alignment holes all the way through, I can get that confused and flip it the wrong direction. So I drill halfway through, I drill a half inch into my material, and then a half inch into the spoil board, so I've got a one inch dowel hole. My dowel, my locating dowels are about seven eighths of an inch long. So I can, I drill a half inch into the material, 
carve that top side, pull the mach- pull the material off, drill my holes in the spoil board, put my dowels in place, flip my material over, and it'll only go on one way. That's why I do asymmetrical holes, and that's why I drill halfway through. It can only be mounted on there one way. And if it's nice and flat against the spoil board, I know that's the right way. It's completely idiot proof, which is what I need. <laughs> so, um, says here the holes will be, a, yeah, Mark, following up, the holes will be in a different location. How did you align it to cut the other side? Uh, I'm going to put a link to a video I did oh, I think it was last year, where I, in fact, I think I put a link to my other two-sided project videos in this video. I think I put a link in there, um, but I'll make sure to put a link to that video down in the description here. I have a total of, I think, five videos on that two-sided machining video uh, or uh, playlist and I think I put a link in the description but I'll make sure to put it in this one too uh, basically when you select those dowel holes on the top of the material then copy them to the other side it places them in the in the the location you want to drill them into the spoil board and they will match up because remember if you think about my fingernail right here while I have my hand up in this direction, fingernail is on the left side, my left side. When I flip it over, it's now on the right side. So everything is going to be reversed that way when you flip that side to side. It's a lot to wrap your head out around at first, but if you do one or two, it just, it's kind of like a jigsaw puzzle. Everything falls into place and it's that, ah, uh, uh, moment, you know? So, uh, what do I mean by rest machining? Um, rest machining is actually a acronym. The rest stands for remaining stock. They take the RE from remaining and ST from stock, put them together, and you have rest machining. What it is is it's a way to carve away the bulk of the material, then go in and highlight any areas that need a little bit more detail work and use a smaller bit to carve those areas without recarving the entire thing. There's some pros and cons to it. And uh, I pointed out, I pointed them out in the video I did. And again, I'll put a link to it in the description of this video, video as soon as we're finished live here. But it's a way to either use a smaller bit in certain areas that need detail or go back and clean up uh, areas. So... And it's a good it's a good technique. The problem is when you go back in with a smaller bit, using a tiny step over, it will look like it was finished a little bit finer than the rest of the project. So there are a couple of cons, and you can kind of see a borderline where you did the rest machining, and where you didn't get the rest machining. So. Uh, but basically, I, 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 you, I use a nylon sanding brush mounted in a drill to sand all my 3D projects. So by the time I get done with that, and I use an, a uh, 120 grit brush, by the time I get done doing that, it all looks the same and it all blends right in. And then I also use the... Uh, uh, scotch bright radial discs in my Dremel and it it just it cleans everything up nice and pretty so let's see here David Jastrom says I use cedar a lot and I typically have to mill it flat do you have any tips on making vectors in vCarve Pro instead of through the mock wizard I use now 
Uh, about the only thing that I can suggest as far as that is concerned, because uh, I too have uh, milled a few things flat on the CNC. Number one, first most important thing is make sure you have your spindle or router trammed just as perfectly as you can get it. Otherwise, you're going to leave tracks when you go to machine that flat. You'll you get some shingling, and um, basically that's where the bit is kind of cutting at an angle, either to the side or forward or backward. You you'll leave marks. The next one is watch how you clamp or mount your material down. I tend to use um, CA glue and tape if the piece is small enough. If it's bigger than, say, 14 inches long and maybe, say, 6 or 8 inches wide, I don't like to do that. I will countersink and screw it the material straight down to my spoil board. And I mean countersink those screws pretty deep, then come back and machine and just you know, machine my uh, stock flat, just being very careful. I have seen other people who like to use clamps. They will use a biscuit jointer to cut a biscuit slot in the side edge of the piece they want to mill flat and mill down their clamps to slip into those biscuit joint slots and clamp down from midway. Um, there are a multitude of ways of getting the same thing done. Other people will mill out a spoil board, mount the piece of material in it, and use wedges to keep it in. There is no perfect way of doing it. However you can clamp that material down is uh, that works for you is a good way. Then all I do is I make a create a pocket tool path that's about that's about the the bit diameter that I'm going to use at least half of that diameter wider than the material on each side and longer on each end and then mill out that entire thing and I'll take 20 to 30 thousandths of an inch off which is about what uh, 20 I think that'd be about a half a millimeter off with each pass and um, get it done that way. And, you know, if I, I'll do it once. If it doesn't take everything off, I'll reset my Z0 and run it again. So it's more or less the same way I made my uh, tool, uh, spoil board surfacing tool path. And I'll put a link to that one in the description of this video, too. Uh, spoil board surfacing. I'll put a link to that in the description box as well. They just made a tool path a little bit bigger than the area that I want to surface and then surface that. So let's see. Um, and I too use cedar a lot, uh, especially um, recycled old broken up pieces of fence board. They work great, especially if the folks you're carving for like rustic projects and if you look on craigslist free section oh boy people are giving them away constantly and i just soon go get material that is destined for the landfill landfill than go out and buy new new ones you know so uh let's see andy white says the tea lids is brilliant for watching the pet yes that was one of them that i was going to uh link and uh, Andy is right. He's talking about a project I did last year where I made some mason jar lids for my wife for her various teas that she likes. And uh, that was a two-sided project. So let's see. How do you get the clip art? The clip art comes with the software. Um, go to Vectric. And log in to your V and Co account if you don't have one. Create one. You should have one. And when you log into your account, you should see on the left side, I believe, uh, a link to your downloads. If you don't have your clip art, 
click on that link and all the clip art that's available to you is listed right there and it's free downloads so uh, but log into your v and company account and there it is so let's see steve steve Purdue says i'm trying to cut some detail carving on text but i keep breaking bits 1 16th inch bits that'll happen if you're breaking bits one of two things is happening either your router spindle rpm is too slow or your feed rate is too fast ramp in your plunge moves that will ease that bit into the material rather than just dropping it straight down and if it's breaking during a cut either you need to speed the router up or slow the feed rate down also watch your depth of cut how deep are you trying to cut i set my depth of cut for half of the bits cutting diameter so on a 16th inch bit you're looking at uh, a pass depth of a 32nd of an inch at a time and uh, you can start kind of nudging things and playing with settings from there uh, it uh, it's a compromise you know I know a fella down in Australia who is an absolute brilliant artist with this stuff and he does mother of pearl inlays on guitar fretboards his name is John, and his YouTube channel is Labels Extreme, and I'll put a link to it. Uh, I'll put a link to his channel in the description of this video. And he has one video where he was doing Mother of Pearl inlays in an ebony fretboard. And if you look at the feed rates he's running with tiny tiny bits we're talking uh one quarter millimeter bits they are so delicate his feed rate is three and a half inches per minute and he still breaks one so you just have to find that balance of where you got to not so much baby your bit but find its limits but if you're breaking bits, it's one of those three things. Either your spindle or router RPM is too slow, you're trying to cut too deep, or you're trying to cut too fast. One of those three things. So kind of back off a little bit, be a little bit more conservative, and you'll find that line. So let's see. Rest machining is done from a recliner. Yes, yes. That's Bob Heltebridal. Post a poster of all things fun, rude, crude, sociably unacceptable. I think you've got this now. Uh, let's see, Bob Ferguson. Any videos planned using the Vectric laser add-on? No, I don't have a laser. Um, I may get one, but um, that's not in the. Uh, it, it's not in the cards right now, so. Let's see. Steve Purdue says, Tools Today gave me the specs. Okay, thanks. They said 18,070 inches per minute. Yeah, I don't use 70 inches per minute on my quarter inch end mills. Two things to remember. Um, Tools Today, Whiteside, um, Onsrud, all these companies that give you the tool files for their tools even they say these are guidelines and they're to be taken and adjusted for your machine and your material. If you're cutting, let's say, a, a circuit board, a printed circuit board, that may be the right uh, RPM and the right feed rate because you're not cutting deep passes. But I would... Just me talking here with that small of a bit, a sixteenth of an inch diameter, I think I have mine set to start at 35 inches per minute with a plunge rate of about 20, I think I have. And then I slow it, you know, I can adjust from there. That might work perfectly. It might be too fast. My smallest bit is three sixty-fourths of an inch, so we're talking teeny tiny, 
and I have slowed it way down as well. Uh, you just have to kind of find that line. Their, their recommendations are for industrial machines, and most home hobby CNC machines are not capable of doing what they want to do, uh, what they recommend you do. So I would definitely slow down that feed rate to about half of that and then try from there. Okay. Uh, Steve Martin says, you keep using old world measurements. They work for me. Can you convert a Nats whisker, please? Yes, I can. It is from Nats whisker to, oh my God, that's small. <laughs> Is that, that good enough? <laughs> um, as far as the, you know, I'm going to do um, a better job of converting to metric for folks because I understand a lot of folks use metric. Most of the world uses metric. I was raised on imperial. That's what I'm used to. You know, when I say something like um, 50 thousandths of an inch, that's half a millimeter roughly. I mean, it's never going to be perfect. I'm used to using Imperial. You're used to using metric. People say metric is more accurate. Eh, it's not more accurate. It's, you know, a measurement is a measurement, no matter what you call it in. So, you know, but I understand we no longer measure our shoe sizes in barley corns and we don't measure distances in chains. So I'm going to do a, try to do a little bit better job of converting to metric for folks. You know, see what happens. Um, let's see. Doug Smith says, how much 3D carving can you do with VCarve Pro compared with Aspire? As far as carving is concerned, they're pretty equal with one, one exception. With VCarve, you can import one STL file that was created in another program. With Aspire, you can import, as, as far as I know, you can uh, import as many as you need. With all of them, you can import as many pieces of clip art from the clip art library as you want. But it's just STL files. The thing to remember about VCarve Pro is it's not a 3D program. It's for 2.5D. They, they do let you carve 3D, but that's not what it was made for. Aspire is the 3D modeling program. Now, VCarve has limited editing abilities for 3D models. You can, you can resize. You can change the position. You can change its thickness. And you can do a few other things with level clipping and uh, the, the different combined modes and the way they are uh, applied to the layers, or excuse me, the levels or the models themselves, but you're very limited on the amount of editing you can do with a 3D model. If you're not looking to create your own 3D models and you just want to carve 3D models, then VCarve will get you started. Um, I used VCarve for the first five years I was doing this and then upgraded to Aspire because I found I was needing just a few more things than VCarve would offer. And one of the best things about Vectric, the company, is they understand that their products are pricey. So if you have VCarve Pro, you've bought VCarve Pro and you're using it, then later on decide you want to upgrade to Aspire, you don't pay full retail for Aspire you pay the difference in price between the two. That makes it a little bit easier of a bite in the wallet. It's still pricey, but it's a little bit easier. And I'll be honest with you, if you're running a business, number one, it's a business expense to do the upgrade. Number two, you should be able to make that up on your first two or three projects that you use it on. If, uh, if you can't, you might want to re-examine how you're running your business, but that's my opinion, not yours. So, Okay, let's see. 
you can do quite a bit of 3D carving with VCarve Pro. I did it, like I said, for, well, I'll, I'll say I did it for four years because I didn't do any 3D carving at first. So, um, let's see. Kurt Briegel, can you please explain why you used the 3D tabs you used in this project as opposed to those in the toolpath setup area? Yes, I can. Because... In the 3D modeling process, the 3D roughing and finishing toolpath would have cut away all the material I needed to make those tabs in the profile toolpath. So let me bring up a spire here and uh, show you what I'm talking about. Go back to the 3D view and flip over to the bottom as you can see out here all of that material is gone even before I got to my cutout toolpath with that gone there's nothing there to to make tabs with that's why I put the 3d tabs in place then I used the create tabs in the cutout toolpath to skip over them. Now I didn't go high enough. It kind of skinned into the uh, into the tool path or into the top of the tab. But there there's nothing there to cut a tab out of. So I had to make it part of the 3D model in order for the material to be left there. I hope that made sense. While I'm here, uh, I also had a question in email asking me why I carved out the center of the uh, foot this way and why I didn't just create a pocket toolpath. The reason for that is by doing the method I did, if I lay it over here and zoom in real close, you can see that the shape of the bowl here, this gentle slope, continues on inside. So I have that little bit of detail. There's it, it, this dome shape continues inside that foot. That's why I did it that way. A pocket tool path, you would just have a flat bottom. Now, Steve Nealon from Harneal Media brought, about, uh, brought up a good question. And he said you need to show people how to create a logo in this foot here for those who might want to do that. So I did it. Now, I haven't run these tool paths yet, so I don't know how they're going to work. I set this up just before I push the button to go live. So this may be a uh, giant mistake, but we'll see how it works here. I used a 30 degree V bit and set a flat depth of 50 thousandths and used an eighth inch end mill to, uh, for my clearance. We're gonna take a look and we're both gonna see it live. I have not pre previewed this. I don't know what it's gonna do. So let's check that out. And it did not carve. So let me go in here. I did project it onto the 3D model. Hmm. Well, that explains that. Maybe there wasn't enough there to carve out. So let's preview it with the 30 degree V bit. And nothing. So it didn't carve anything. I'm going to have to go in and uh, find out what's going on here. Okay, no worries. Well, basically all you would do is, once I figure out what I did wrong, um, projecting the toolpath onto the 3D model is normally the way to go with a V-carved toolpath. But we shall see. Okay. I'll have to figure that out. Thank you for bringing up the uh, idea, Steve. I'll have to go in and find out what I'm doing wrong now. <laughs> but yes, there is a way to uh, go in and V-carve a logo into the bottom of a, uh, of a project. I just obviously didn't get my setup correct. Uh, let's see. 
John, uh, let's see where to go. It just jumped. Um, John Sautier says, I've used what they call tabletop fasteners with a biscuit cut to hold material down. I know what you mean now. Uh, you're talking about the metal tabs that are used to hold a tabletop down to a frame. Good idea. Good idea. Uh, Lewis Denton says, can you expand on what desktop can do with 3D? For the most part, it can do everything that VCarve Pro can do. There are a few exceptions. Um, but if you go back to some of my older 3D carving videos, um, VCarve Desktop can do everything that I've been doing. For instance, this morning's video can be done on VCarve Desktop. Everything that I did in that video will work on VCarve Desktop and VCarve Pro. So, okay. Let's see. I uh, need help calibrating the Z-axis. I'm using NC Studio. I have never used NC Studio. I would go over and see if you can find a support community for NC Studio, either a support uh, forum or Facebook page. And ask the question there. I have never used NC Studio. Or I wouldn't know where to start. So, Mario Medina says, do a video on it next week. I'll try. <laughs> I can't guarantee anything. I've got other things going on that I'm trying to put together a video for. If they don't fall into place, I will go ahead and do that. So, um... Uh, does the starting depth affect the logo cut or projecting it cover that? Projecting is supposed to cover that. That's why I say I need to go into it. Um, uh, okay, since your 3D model included the foot, the V-carve is seeing that component. You may need to adjust your cut depth. I was wondering about that. You know what, uh, Mike? You are absolutely right. I forgot totally about that. I'll be willing to bet you. I have the, uh, I'll be willing to bet you, if I go over here into my modeling tab, I have the foot turned on. So, if I turn off the foot, I forgot about that 100%. Go back over here, project tool path onto 3D model, calculate, and we shall try the clearance. Toolpath. There we go. Mike, you are a genius. You are a genius. I had the foot turned on. So there is my logo in the bottom of the bowl. Projected down. <sighs> so there's the answer, Mario. <laughs> I don't need to do the video next week. I forgot that I had that foot model turned on. With the foot model turned on, it was reading this surface. It was projecting onto the surface of the foot that I had machined away. That's what was going on. Always learning, folks. Always learning. And um, I don't think it's ever going to stop. But, yeah. Thank you for that, Mike. I do appreciate it. Man. Well, hey, what can you say? Now, this is uh, going to be a little bit of a foreshadowing thing here. But um, somebody gave me an idea in Facebook today to take that, that bowl idea that I did this morning and then use one of my state outlines to make a dish carved into the shape of the state. Now, that might be difficult for some place like Hawaii, Florida, California even. But on a rectangular state like mine, or Pennsylvania, or Michigan, or New York, or Indiana, Illinois... That might be a fun idea to play with. So we'll see what's going on. Let's see. I all Peleg says, uh, instead of turning the foot on and off, could you not have some other element there that is in the subtract mode? You, you probably could. 
um, my interest in there was to show, and then I forgot to explain it in the video, Inside Baseball again, I recorded that video five times and had a problem, not with the program, but something happening around here, either an airplane flying overhead or sirens going off or something. That was the fifth take of that video. I forgot to mention in the video what I was talking about earlier. When they, after I hollowed that out, I wanted the bottom of that to follow the shape of that bowl. I wanted that dome shape within that foot. And that was the way to do it. So, okay, let's see. Um, Kurt Briegel says, I turn bowls on the lathe. I used a branding iron for the logo, etc. There's a lot of people that do that. And if you have a laser and the laser module, very easy to laser that into the bottom of the bowl too. Or if you happen to be like Steve Nealon from Harneal Media and have a separate laser, you can just take whatever project he's finished with, flip it over and put it in the laser, laser that logo in the bottom and he's done. He can do that even after he's finished finishing the, the uh, project. So, uh, thank you for that, Michael. The, thank you very much for that. Um, you could, uh, to answer your question, I all, yes, you could, you could very easily have some other element in there that's in subtract mode. If you wanted to carve, uh, something, another piece of clip art, a Celtic weave or, uh, an animal or something like that, you could do that in either merge, add, or subtract, depending upon how you place the model. So, well, with all of my messing around and fumbling around with trying to get my audio set up. We've run really late. So I'm going to go ahead and call this one done. Um, this is not going to be the only 3D Bowl video I do. I'm, I am going to go out and cut this project and I'll show it in another video. But I'm also going to get into gluing up materials and making larger like say a uh, maybe a 14 inch charger or a, a big dish um yes the first seven minutes of this video was perfect i know you've been talking to my wife haven't you she gets tired of hearing me ramble as well but i've got some more ideas for other dishes and other bowls and let me tell you these are great little side gifts if you can make a few up beforehand and if you invited to Christmas parties or you're invited to uh, Thanksgiving bringing over goodies and putting them in this bowl and then giving that bowl to the host at the end of the party is always very much appreciated I like to make these out of walnut or maple be careful with walnut if any of the friends or family has a uh, nut allergy. I would go with maple or a mahogany. And then I finish them in a pharmaceutical grade mineral oil. And that's it. That's enough. They will need to be re-oiled from time to time. But a pharmaceutical grade mineral oil makes a great finish on these. And uh, it's inert. It's food grade. It, everything is perfect with that. But people really appreciate the little side gift. So, all right. Thank you, everybody. Um, I appreciate your patience with the uh, fun we had in the first seven minutes of this video. Uh, I've got to wait until this is processed. Then I can go back and remove all the mid-roll ads YouTube wants to put in this. Um, I was a little late in doing that on the video this morning as well. Um, so if you're seeing more than one ad in this, I've got to wait for the video to process before I can go back and get rid of them. But all of the mid-roll ads will be removed from this video as soon as I can do it. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a great Sunday. Go make some chips. Get out in the shop and have fun. Y'all take care.